I'm, I'm pleased to come back to the research project that I've been running now for uh, two years uh, with support from the European Research Council on uh, monoculture. Um, I'm glad to be here, um, not least because this conference really shows me uh, what it really means to do history on a world scale and how limited your means are when you try to encounter something as complicated as this uh, planet. Um, as many of you have realized already, I don't speak uh, Portuguese. Um, my command over languages is basically two and a half languages. The half is French. Um, so um, I'll try to listen as attentively as I can and maybe understand a bit here and there. But um, anyway, if I talk to one of you and inquire about a paper and you get the feeling um, he didn't really get what I said, that's maybe because you spoke Portuguese here. Um, anyway, there is a diversity of languages. And there is the diversity uh, of monoculture. And before I make a false move, my, my PowerPoint is here. What you realize when you do monocultures on a global scale, the first thing is that you realize is there is really a huge diversity of monocultures around the world. There is the um, almond trees um, that, oops. We got it. There we are. Almond trees uh, in California. California produces more than two thirds of all almonds uh, worldwide. Um, there is Blue Mountain coffee uh, from Jamaica. It looks much messier um, than uh, the tidy rows of almond trees. Uh, but nonetheless, qualifies as a monoculture under my definition. There is the cornfields of Iowa that extend towards the horizon. There is tobacco farming in Zimbabwe. All these are types of uh, monoculture. Um, um, and I have other projects um, um, that I'm looking at, including one project on eucalyptus trees. I know two of you are presenting on eucalyptus. I'll try to understand as much as I can because uh, one of my research fellows works on eucalyptus trees um, in uh, India. Um, and of course, if you look at this diversity of plants, of regions, of producers, uh, the question comes, oh, does it make sense to look at all this um, as a global phenomenon? The lion's share of engagement of studies of monoculture is that they look at a certain place, a certain product. Uh, and many books actually start with that emphatic saying, you know, my monoculture is special because, and what? Well, my first argument today is that they are actually much more similar than we often realize. There is um, a global baseline of similarities in the monocultures. And when I use that phrase, I use that also by way of self-advertising because um, this uh, book, um, was, well, published last year. Um, before I think I'm trying to boost sales here, it's out as an ebook uh, from April uh, in this year. So it's uh, available free of charge courtesy of the European taxpayer. Uh, but in this book, I make the argument that environmental challenges provide a very good way to write world history because we have the ability to make world history simpler. There is a baseline of similarities um, that uh, runs through the environmental channels of the world. They're not identical, but they're reasonable, similar, so that you can work with them. And monoculture is a great example for this uh, global uh, similarity. You have monocultures in the global north and the global south, um, in rich countries, in poor countries. Uh, wherever you look, you see that monocultures gravitate uh, towards the rely uh, that organic production will be greater to relies on one and only uh, plant. Um, and uh, the basic question that I'm trying to explore is why is that the case? Why do we see this drift in otherwise very different uh, monocultures or to phrase it in the hydraulic terms, the vortex of course is a play with uh, watery metaphors. If you want to phrase my project in terms of the language of hydrology, that would be it. How does something as complicated as the global food system get built in the roaring waters? of global modernity. Why does this come together? So that is the overall goal in this project. We, I look at different monocultures in different parts of the world, trying to tease out the uh, parallels, the common pattern, the recurring uh, challenges. And I'll listen very attentively to your presentations today and tomorrow uh, in order to learn more about uh, monocultures uh, in Portugal and, and, and elsewhere, because that's really what global history should be. It should be based on understanding of um, monocultures and organic production regimes in as many parts of the world. After all, that is the ambition of the project, to come up 
with a framework that allows to understand uh, monocultures everywhere on the planet, that everybody can uh, take the book that will come out of this and look at what I described for certain places at certain um, times and say, yeah, we, we know this because something very similar happens in my own place. So that's the big challenge that I'm trying to encounter. And that's really how I approach it. There is the general similarity that I'm trying to tease out. And the greatest similarity for all the diversity of the monocultures around the world is they have one thing in common. We do not know why they're actually still around because that is the fundamental paradox that runs through the history um, of uh, monoculture. And it's very easy to overlook this because these monocultures are everywhere. They're in agriculture, they're in forestry, just look at the eucalyptus trees in your country. Um, wherever you look, you see this drift was monoculture, even in eco farming. If you look closely, you see that yes, they are more diverse than your standard farm, uh, but in economic terms, one commodity uh, often, not always, but often dominates uh, organic farming. Um, if you see this everywhere, you would guess, yeah, there must be some kind of theory, some kind of approach or paradigm that explains why this is a good idea. That is not the case. There is no plausible theory of monoculture. There is no paradigm, no rationale, nothing that would you could call a logically consistent system that offers a degree of intellectual clarity. What you do have is plenty of empirical and conceptual evidence that monoculture is a really bad idea. There are plenty of studies that show there are theoretical problems, there are empirical problems. Um, we, we know that the case for environmental diversity and biological diversity um, is very strong. And nonetheless, we see organic production is going towards monoculture. And that's a pretty unique situation if you look at it. For most of the things that define global modernity, we have some kind of you know paradigm. If you think about you know, the rule of law or you know functioning markets or a personal note, academic research, you always have this general idea, yes, this is this is how it should work and that's why it's a good idea. Of course, we know that reality is more complicated than that, but at least we have this kind of theory um, that provides us with uh, bearings. No, that does not exist for monoculture. And uh, it's crucial to recognize that this is not the wisdom of insight that after the fact I come up with, they should have known. No, people at the time did know exactly that. Because if you look closely, you see that the doubts about monoculture are inside the systems of monoculture. It's something that is very familiar um, to the producers. Let me give an example from one of the uh, case studies. Um, a case study that will also give you an idea about the uh, sacrifice of um, doing the study of monoculture on a global scale. Um, we have uh, quite a treasure trove of stories from the front lines because well, some monocultures exist in very inhospitable places. Um, um, one of my research fellows works on cardamom in India. And she can tell you uh, nice stories about how it feels when leeches curl around your lead, lead ring finger. Um, not everybody looks reasonably disgusted. So I looked up the Portuguese word for uh, leeches, uh, Sanji Zurga. Um, that's, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that one word in Portuguese, but you know what I mean. And you know how it you know, feels when they suck up to your uh, hand. Well, that's what my research fellow Anu Krishna can tell you about. You can see the extent of my own sacrifice in doing research when I tell you that my first research trip in January uh, 22 uh, went to uh, Florida. Um, I had to cope with things like a lot of sunshine, uh, but it's actually a pretty interesting place for somebody looking at monocultures. There's a citrus industry in Florida, one of the two big pillars of the agricultural economy um, of uh, Florida and not studied extensively, far less than uh, California oranges. In fact, citrus is so important in Florida that there has been a government division on citrus affairs um, since the 1930s and exists to this day. So when I looked up the bulletin on citrus growing in Florida issued by the Florida Department of Agriculture in 1939, I thought it would obvious what would be in there. Emphatic praise that citrus is, uh, you know, the greatest thing since the invention of the wheel. Well, what they actually said was something different. And a quote from 
this uh, bulletin, what they wrote is, and I quote, one crop farming has never been entirely satisfactory to the farmers who have tried it. Where there is a diversity of crops, the labor and equipment can be much more efficiently employed throughout the year than where only one crop is produced, unquote. And you see similar quotations for many other monocultures. And please note, this is not a quotation about the side effects, that this is bad for others. It's a quotation that highlights it's not good for the producers themselves to put every all, all eggs in one uh, basket. So when I talk about the problems of monoculture, this is something that runs through the monocultures themselves, um, that... Um, this, there is a recognition very early on among the producers themselves that this is a delicate, uh, paradoxical um, endeavor. Um, when I look at monoculture, I keep coming back to a German phrase um, that um, highlights uh, this, not coined for monoculture, but it's it's uh, when you study monoculture, it's a bit like, well, Sinnstiftung des Sinnlos. Maybe I'll allow for one German phrase here. Um, that it translates into making sense of something that doesn't make sense. That is what studying monoculture is about. You um, try to um, wrestle with something that is not sensible. Um, and the key goal is to, well, find ways to talk about this sense of unease and find a rationale for monoculture that is not logically consistent. If others haven't found it, I probably uh, won't either. Um, but that allows us to understand um, why monocultures are still around. Now, how do you rationalize something that is inherently rational? Well, my proposal is let's look at monoculture as a form of magical thinking. And when I say magic, I don't mean superstition or supernatural forces. Um, when, when you talk about magic, you talk about something that you cannot explain rationally, but that nonetheless exists. And that is what monoculture is about. It's about the hope that, you know, things will somehow work out. We can't really explain why, but maybe it will all be uh, good. And uh, it's a type of magic that brings people to uh, do something that they cannot explain in a logically consistent way, but still go for. And it's a way to highlight the inherent contradictions without making this completely irrational. I'm very eager to say magic. You can believe, you can have good reasons to believe um, in uh, magic and you can have motivations. And um, I'll give you four motivations that people um, have when they engage with monoculture and put a lot of time and effort and money um, into uh, monoculture. The first and probably the most important motivation is the license to unlimited greed that is inherent in uh, modern capitalism. I don't think I need to elaborate at great length because the evidence for that read is all around us. When we talk about agriculture, you talk about the departure from um, a long tradition of subsistence as a goal, if not the defining goal of agriculture. A tradition that, of course, goes back to the Neolithic uh, revolution. You always have some kind of market orientation in agriculture, but usually the first goal was just to feed the people on your farm. That goal shrinks and ultimately disappears in the age of global modernity. Pre-modern farmers fear starvation. Modern farmers fear bankruptcy. And that makes a world of difference. So the license to unlimited greed is important. The second is the faith of the human ability to improve nature. Um, that um, is the experience that science can change crops, can change animals, uh, can change production processes, that they can boost yields per acre, that they can fix problems. That always happens at a price, but there's a deep faith that science will come to um, the rescue, whatever kind of problem you may have. And you see that um, the, the, the line between proven abilities and magic um, are very fluid here. Of course, science can solve problems. And of course, science cannot solve every problem. Why should it? Um, um, if, if it were just a matter of wishful thinking, we'd, we would live in a very different uh, world. So science can do something, but the faith that it can do everything is part of magic thinking. A third motivation in play here is the quest for cognitive 
clarity or in quest for simplicity. There's a recurring hope in monocultures that if you focus on one product only, things will get simpler. And the amazing thing is that this idea refuses to die in spite of the fact that it has been disproven time and again. No, monocultures are not simpler um, than other types of agriculture. It's just complicated in its own peculiar way. And that's what producers realized uh, time and again. And yet this idea of it's all simpler just refuses to die. Um, it's something that I'm trying to theorize or where I look at people who have an idea about what could be behind this, you know, recurring idea that monoculture is, is, is simple. If you have any ideas on that front, please uh, let me know. But I'm coming back to this simple truth in that we humans are really very simple minds in, in, in certain ways that somehow we're unable intellectual to really understand what the web of nature means, uh, that we keep looking for linear interaction in a world that is about complex uh, correlations. But when I speak of the simple minds in play here, maybe I should be more specific. Maybe this is not something about humans, but specifically about men. And that's my fourth point when it comes to um, a form of masculine. There is something distinctly masculine at play in the world um, of, of monoculture. If you look at, uh, and there's a certain male archetype in play here. If you, as you look at the, the people in monoculture, you see um, a resolve, a determination, you see a faith in technology, you see an esprit de corps, you see a distance from the rest of society and a self-understanding that says, yeah, the rest of them just doesn't understand what it really takes to do this uh, job. Um, and the conviction, of course, that people should be grateful that somebody does this job. And you look at this criteria, I guess that reminds you something, that in, in many ways, the people working in monoculture are similar to the modern soldier. When we talk about monoculture, we really talk about men in uh, battle mode and the parallel between going to war and being in a war and being in a monoculture. Um, and there are quite a lot of parallels that uh, I'm currently trying to uh, think out. There's particularly one precedent that I have in mind when it comes to modern uh, soldiers. Um, it's the US type of white warfare as it was uh, shown in the Second World War. This type of warfare that isn't just about winning the war, it's about um, overwhelming the enemy with um, overwhelming force because the U.S. had so much in, in resources that's such great superiority in, in scientific skills. It's not just winning the war. It's really about kicking the enemy out of the uh, arena. Um, that is the kind of warfare that ideally in a, in a successful thriving monoculture is being waged. So these are my four um, motivations, what people have in mind when they go for monoculture. And you see, these are aspirations that do not add up, they do not come together in some magical uh, way, but of course they matter and they drive people to go for monoculture time and again. The magic doesn't work out and that is the next point that I would like to uh, get across here. When you talk about everyday life in a monoculture, you talk about wrestling with a never-ending crisis. Keeping a monoculture life is a matter of perennial crisis uh, management. And we should really try to get under the skin of these people who are trying to keep a monoculture running. What does it mean to operate in permanent battle mode, to be in a place where you have to struggle to um, keep your monoculture working um, on a daily basis? Feel free to we have a kind of right-wing um, <laughs> auditorium here. So uh, if you want to yeah. move over here, um, we have space here. Um, but that's, that's really what I'm trying to, um, you know, there is no hope for anything resembling uh, stability. If I may quote my citrus people in Florida again, um, one of the books that I read um, in, in, in trying to make sense of Florida Oranges was the 50 year anniversary volume of the Florida Citrus Exchange. Usually that's not a kind of book that you read with great pleasure because you think these people are telling you that they're greatest ever. Well, there is a sentence in that um, 50 year anniversary book that really made me think, uh, which uh, said, and I quote, the Florida Citrus industry had never, it seems, known a normal season. 
that's quite a sentence after 50 years. For 50 years, you did not have a normal season. There's always something going wrong, something needs fixing, and you do not know whether the crisis that you're faced with may be the terminal. So many things can kill um, a monoculture, changing markets, changing technologies, new competitors, um, diseases, uh, overproduction. So many things can go wrong and do go wrong on, on, on a daily basis. So being in a monoculture is being um, in a battle on many fronts. Um, and you don't have a theory, you do not have a, a clear paradigm, and you know that you need to make it so. And maybe I could point out here that this reading of prices is different from the understanding of prices that we are used to when we live in an affluent Western society. Um, the dominant thinking in a country like Britain um, or Germany or the US is when we talk about crisis, you talk about something that is thematically, spatially, chronologically limited. You can bracket it out. Um, that's what we've come accustomed to see as crisis um, in Western society. And I would be curious to hear your feedback here, because my suspicion is this is something that we've grown accustomed to in the boom years, uh, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, when um, the economies were thriving all over the Western industrialized uh, world, um, what the French call the uh, Trente Glorieuses, the 30 glorious uh, years. Um, that gave us this feeling, you know, if there's a crisis, you can limit it, you can bracket it out as the, the exception and the normal is not uh, wrestling with crisis. Um, anyway, I would be curious to hear your feedback on this point, because my understanding of Portuguese history is that, well, the 30 glorious years weren't all that glorious um, in, in, in Portugal. So maybe um, that understanding of crisis is facing difficult years and certainly face difficult when we move in the 21st century. I've talked about this with my students. Uh, in Germany and, and, and the UK, um, they don't understand this idea of why crisis is something that you can bracket out or limit or see as an exception. Living with crisis is the new normal in the 21st century world. But let me not go into this. It's, it's key to understand that in a way what monoculture means is dealing with, um, and it's a challenge um, for historical narration, which is what we historians do. We're trying to compile narratives, we try to tell uh, stories um, about the world. How do you tell a story when it's all about um, recurring troubles, lingering problems, um, about stumbling on? You, you start to recognize that this Western idea of crisis is also a perfect structuring device. You know, a crisis evolves and people do something about it, they try to solve it, and then you have some kind of ending that you impose, and by that point you can summarize how we dealt with the crisis. You know, th this understanding for us is a perfect narrative uh, structuring device and it doesn't work for monoculture. It doesn't work when you have um, crises that just do not go away. So a lot of my narrative will look at the trouble spots, the lingering crisis, trying to tease out what the crisis means and whether there is recurring issues in these crises. I'm talking about the driving forces and how they change and how power relations change uh, in this, and I'll talk about enabling contacts. And just to give you a taste of what um, I'm trying to do here, I'd like to highlight two of these um, enabling um, contacts, not least with a view to the topics that um, we'll talk about today uh, and tomorrow. One very important context is the power um, of uh, science. Um, I've mentioned that, that very often this is the default reaction of any monoculture, wherever you go, um, you know, let's look at, let's recruit, let's hire some scientists who then have the task to um, solve this. You know, the crisis of monoculture are a first rate creator of scientific institutions. Very often you see, if you look at when, when do institutions get founded, not when monocultures are ascendant, they get founded when the monocultures are into trouble. So in a way, monocultures create science, not the other way around. Um, and that is also a, a, a typical situation when, um, well, I call them repairmen here because there is a distinct type of repair science that when the monoculture runs into trouble, very often it's biological, that there is a disease, that there is a fungus, that there is a, a pest that eats its way through a monoculture that then um, planters, farmers, whatever um, it, it may be, um, say, well, we need to hire someone who looks at and come up with a fix and then the experts parachute in and well try to find something that 
um, contains the problem, solves the problem. That's a word that you rarely use because really solving, usually it's more about keeping problems at bay, but that's as good um, as it gets. And of course, any talk about you know scientific independence or intellectual pursuit, that's not really what these people are about. It's about finding a solution and better be quick. And if they succeed, that can be the ticket for permanent solution. And if they don't succeed, they're out of the job very quickly. So repair is a key job here. There is the optimizers um, that um, need a very different mindset. It's about teasing out biological potential increasing yield, finding new breeds, um, species with a higher, well, yield per acre if it's a plant, conversion of feet into flesh if it's an animal or if it's, you know, eggs or milk or whatever is in play here. So optimizing, improving um, growth condition is a key job of scientists, which is a very different job from the repair job. For the repair job, you need an open mind uh, for uh, optimization, you need more of a narrow focus on some parameter. Usually it's breeding, um, it's about genetic potential. Um, so these optimize very much um, about uh, reductionist view. One parameter that is supposed to change it all. Um, there is the control freaks. Controlling, standardizing uh, parameters for growth is a key part of um, the, you, the the, the, the uh, context of, of science. Um, that, well, if you control everything, the climate, the soil, uh, the feet, uh, any type of inputs, if you control this very rigorously, you can have standardized pro uh, production that uh, boost uh, productivity. Um, and it's hard to overstate the extent of control that's going on here. If you look at um, American pork producers, um, which is in a way, factory farming is part of this. Monoculture has a tendency to think of this in terms of plants, but for me, factory farming is in, in many ways the culmination of the project of monoculture because everything that they do, concentration of one plant, optimizing everything, controlling everything, trying to um, get through as many crises as, as you can uh, stomach. Um, that, that's really what you find in, in, in factory farming as well. And the extent of control, because they're all afraid of the pathogens that um, may, of course, spread in factory farms uh, very quickly. Um, um, American populists are now at the point where they follow social media accounts of their employees because they want to know who they are in contact with and maybe the people they're contact with work on another uh, uh, factory farm and then they can be um, a pathway for a pathogen. That's the level where we're at, where people uh, try to follow the private contacts of their employees um, as a way to contain diseases. And of course, that doesn't work. You always meet someone um, 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 that, that works somewhere and has a pathogen. We all know after COVID-19 that controlling um, the spread of pathogens um, is a very, a very tricky endeavor. And yet that's where they are. And that's where the controlling mindset plays out. There's a fourth type of scientist that I'd like to stress here because you know, to get all this together, you need sorcerers with that uh, magic touch. You see how the metaphor of magic uh, plays out here, because that's what is, is astounding. This isn't just about scientific skills or potential on you. Well, of course, these are important, but time and again, you find that um, the motley crew of monocultures gather around one charismatic leader, one person, usually a male person, that um, offers more than skills and more than achievements, who embodies that these new things will work on, who symbolized this new approach. Classic example, Norman Borlaug, the father of the Green Revolution, uh, the person who symbolized that, yes, these high yielding varieties will be better and I've tried them and I've um, spread them all the world. I talk with people, they trust me. That is the message from these uh, sorcerers. So this blessing from an authority um, is crucial here as a way to cover up the contradictions of this uh, endeavor. Because if you look at these many uses of science, no, this does not add up. It's maybe a, a patchwork of things, a patchwork of individual contributions that um, um, has no guarantee that it will be holistic. Quite the contrary, it's, it's anything but holistic. Um, and nobody knows whether this endeavor can continue, whether improvements, biological uh, improvements, increases in yields, whether they will continue in anything that the scale that we've seen. We certainly know that the spread of pathogens is very hard 
uh, to control. It's quite possible that one day we'll talk about the monocosm for Asia as the brief moment in history where um, the plants were ahead of the pathogens, um, when biological transfers took place that for a while allowed monocultures to thrive because the pathogens have not yet caught up um, on this planet or had not yet developed. Um, as you know, um, uh, pathogens uh, change constantly. Um, so whether science can keep up the project of monoculture for a long time is very much an open question. You hurry a bit and we'll talk briefly about the second um, enabling context, which is a story about the modern state um, as a creator of institutions um, for research, development, marketing support. Um, of course, we're aware that the state is, is very important in building the scaffolding of uh, global capitalist exchange. Um, but predict is there as the saver of embattled producers, because that is the default reaction when you see a monoculture that goes into trouble. Let's talk to the government. Maybe they can help us with tax breaks or customs protection um, or marketing or whatever it may be. That is um, a, next to the, the scientists, the second authority that uh, producers turn to and often turn to with an amazing success rate right? because monocultures are big. They are rich, very often with a few um, big um, parts of the economies, they can pressure states uh, into compliance. The story of capture of the modern state is, I think, a lot um, about. Anyway, I talk a lot about how um, there are enabling contexts that allow monocultures to survive, but maybe it's time to acknowledge the obvious. Not every monoculture survives, and certainly not every producer survives. This is a story about uh, failure uh, from the beginning, starting with the Caribbean sugar plantations, um, which often come across as this, you know, monumental stable. They're anything but stable. It's a get-rich-quick scheme where it's all about extracting a lot of profits from um, the, the land and the people, insert slaves, well, as quickly as possible, because you knew this is not going um, to run on forever. Um, so the instability, the flexibility, the boom and bust cycles, it's amazing how quickly um, a monoculture has moved from um, a new market, a new product that can expand towards overproduction crisis. Rarely more than a decade. So failure is part of this game individually and as a monoculture until, well, failure is no longer an option. And that is my third point, um, that there is something going on after 1945, that all of a sudden monoculture is something that is around and it's it, it's in, in, it going through cycles to something that, well, where, where failure is no longer an option. It's, there is distinct brutalization after 1945, again, something that we're trying to work out um, in this uh, project, but they grow to new size, they grow to new intensity, they grow into an energy dependence. Traditionally, agriculture is a net producer uh, of energy because the task of farming, after all, is to, is to convert sunshine into food products. Um, well, that no longer works in the world that we're in because they're uh, wedded to uh, fossil uh, energies. There's the reliance on experts that tell you what to do because they have cognitive abilities that uh, you lack. So all these things get way more intensive. They're around earlier, but they gain a new quality and there's a new level of technological um, lock in that people cannot change um, their way of farming because they have invested too much into certain technologies that you cannot change uh, towards another product. If you are in factory farming, everything is geared towards, well, it's chicken or it's uh, um, a beef um, or it's uh, pigs. You can change from pigs to something else without writing off all that equipment. So you have a new level of determination uh, of, of and there and it's important to recognize this brutalization is a global uh, trend um or indicated to that that this is one of the key goals of this monoculture to get away from this idea you know there are things how we go in the west and there are things how they go in the global south monoculture the brutalization of monoculture takes place everywhere the difference is that in the post 945 western world you have rich cities that can take in a lot of the uh, rural people who no longer have a place in, in the new world of monocultures. And you have rich states that can offer lots of subsidies. Neither of these things are uh, exist, these kind of cushions. They don't exist in the global south by and large. Uh, and if they exist, they're enormously expensive uh, for uh, these uh, young, young nations. Um, that's what makes for a world of difference, that um, a lot of the transformation in the Western world 
um, was cushioned because uh, people were willing to put a lot of money um, into supporting these agriculture. And it's important to recognize that this brutality is not something that comes to an end. There is kind of a, a master narrative that, yes, we had the excesses of the post-war years, but then came environmentalism somewhere around 1970, and it highlighted the costs of progress, and people turned around. Well, that's not what is happening uh, with monoculture. Of course, there are environmentalists that point out to problems. There is a growing sector of organic farming, but the overall picture is about an ongoing um, brutalization. Post-1970, environmentalism did not make a world of uh, difference. I could go through different... Um, indications. I think the most troublesome or the most troublesome is the uh, growing power of large corporations that monopolize not only markets, but also knowledge. So changing, um, finding pathways out of monoculture. Well, a lot of things have to fall into place. But one thing is certain, if we do not have effective control of these new corporate monopolies, we won't go anywhere because we do not have the cognitive resources to do it. Anyway, um, I'm nearing the end of my time here. And of course, the question when you bring your project up to the present is the big so what question. Not an easy question for a historian. We like to do our stories when you know things have settled down. No chance of that if you do monoculture. It's it's an ongoing endeavor, more radical than ever. And it's important for us to write this story as an eminently open-ended story. We do not know whether this, you know, maybe this will go on for another hundred years, or maybe what we are currently witnessing is uh, the prelude to the fall. Maybe in 50 years we all see this as something that, yeah, monoculture was tried at the moment, but it just didn't prove sustainable. We do not know, and uh, we should write in a way that um, makes sense in both uh, scenarios. But for the moment, my, my question is not so much about how will this play out. My concern is how do you communicate such a project to the stakeholders? I started with the absence of a theory uh, for uh, monoculture. Um, and maybe we as people in the humanities, me as a historian, we should make an effort to talk to these people. Um, and if you do that, I think a key is that you talk their language. And that's what I'd like to conclude this session by offering you a law that should guide the study of monoculture. And I have a suspicion that many of you think you know, <laughs> defining laws, that's not something that you should do as a historian. That's something for the economists uh, to, to come up with. But that's exactly the point, you know, that um, if you want to get attention beyond the discipline, speak the language of the others. And if you look at the economists, you know, there, there are different types of economists and the different types of laws in play uh, in the economic profession. My personal inspiration um, is uh, from this uh, woman, Eleanor Ostrom, who I think many of you will know, the first woman to receive the Nobel Award for Economic Science, um, Perry Nova Governing the Commons, key uh, book on how can people manage property uh, collectively. So Governing the Commons is fairly well known. What is less recognized is that this book was also a critique of excessive modeling and theorizing in economics. She actually explicitly said this book is a framework rather than a model. And that's something that also holds true for my own uh, work. I don't propose a model, but um, I probably can come up with a model here. And correctly, the law named after Ostrom, Ostrom's law, is not something that Ostrom came up um, herself. It's something that uh, another scholar, Lee Fennell, um, uh, coined uh, Lee Fennell, works at the University of Chicago. And if there is any place on this planet that knows how economists tick, it's probably the University of Chicago. Uh, you just need a law in your name if you want to be anything in economics. So upon the 20th anniversary of governing the commons, Lee Fennell proposed um, what she called Ostrom's Law, a resource arrangement that works in practice can work in theory. Now that's powerful, but maybe we should push that a bit further and come up with a law that captures what monoculture is about. It's about a type of improvisation theater that plays out on a global scale. It's eminently open-ended. It has enormous stakes because what we talk about here is whether we will have the ability to feed billions and billions of humans on our planet. Um, this is not a history um, that is about the heroic conquest of hunger. It's a history of muddling through without a climax, without I don't like to go resolutions. Things just linger 
in an eminently open-ended way. Um, maybe we'll improvise our way through this for another hundred years, or maybe the collapse is already happening. We just don't recognize it enough. So we need a law that really captures this uh, perennial quest for solutions. Um, the that acknowledges the destruction that goes on both in the uh, form of creative destruction and, well, sometimes destruction is just destructive destruction, and a law that allows us to write the history of monoculture as an impossible project, something that should never have worked, but somehow did um, for some time. So all this is what I like to capture with my own law um, in the spirit of Ostrom's law. So anyway, without further ado, let me conclude this presentation by presenting you with the law that, in my humble opinion, should guide the study of monocultures from now on. A resource arrangement that cannot work in theory can stumble on in practice. That is what I wish to call Frank's law of monoculture and I hope you appreciate the law as much as the acronym that goes with it, FLOM. <laughs> and no, it's not a coincidence that you cannot cite FLOM without a smile. And with that, I will rest my case. Thank you. <laughs>